<laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Friday Night Vespers. How many of you thankful it's Friday night? That's what I thought. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to start song service. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for letting us be being able to come here on your Sabbath day and help us to have uh, blessed Vespers as we get a message today. In Jesus' name, amen. Cruz. Three eighteen, wider than snow. Five row three, a quiet place.
Saul. Three seventy three, seeking the lost. Five ninety eight, watch ye saints.
shall proclaim the mystery finished. Oh, he comes. Oh, Jesus comes. Oh, he comes. He comes all glorious. Jesus comes to reign victorious. Oh, he comes. Jesus comes. Um, my goodness. Colton. <laughs> One twenty two, hark the herald angels sing. Forty. I'm a pilgrim. Wait for oh. I heard you the first time. Four forty. How cheering is the Christian song?
Marco. Ninety-two. This is my father's world. Great perfect. 
Brody. Oh, please sit. Good evening, Washita Hills, and a happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. This evening, this is the part of our Vesper service where we come with praises and prayer requests to God. I want to start with praises first because the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, chapter 100, verse 4, that we should enter his courts with thanksgiving and enter his, uh, rather it says enter his, his um Gates, thank you, <laughs> Thanksgiving, and enter his courts with praise. Uh, we're going to start with uh, three, we're going to do three praises, three prayer requests. Who wants to start? Danny. Well, tonight I would just want to say uh, praise the Lord for um, brotherly love and brotherly kindness. Um, 
this week, or l rather last week, a friend of mine asked me what I was doing for Thanksgiving, and I said, well, um, I'm going to go Canvas because I won't be able to afford to go home in California. <laughs> and um, they said, oh, okay. And after a series of questions and everything, they're like, Danny, um, if you don't go to back to California, when will you be able to see your mom again? Well, until May of next year. Mm -hmm. And when was the last time that you saw her? Well, it was New Year's. And so you're, you're going to spend 15, 16 months without seeing your mom? I'm like, uh, well, yeah, because that's my lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then this week I received an email that had a flight confirmation to go back to California for the holidays. So I just want to praise the Lord for that. Amen. It's always good to spend uh, holidays with the family. Hannah Cruz. Um, oh, this is kind of early, but my grandpa's going to be 92 on Sunday. Amen. And so I'm really happy for him. He's, he's such a fun guy, and I love him so much. And I'm glad that he's made it this far. Amen. Amen. Do we have one other praise? Ezekiel. happy that my friend Jonathan and Saren are here. They came to visit us from Wichita, Kansas. Amen. And yeah, so it was this big blessing to see them that they came. So. Amen. Let us transition to prayer requests. Does anybody have a prayer request? Greg. <laughs> uh, happy Sabbath to everybody. And my prayer request would be for this new semester, this fresh semester, to go well for the all everybody, everybody in the academy, because it is uh, the first quarter. Excuse me, because um, it can't be stressful. But now, since clean slate, now it's better to improve upon. Amen. We have another prayer request, Raúl. So, I know my father, like like me personally, and my family. We don't have like big, large wallets. And uh, I know my father in heaven hey, man. owns uh, a lot. And so I'm banging on um, him providing for my car. I have a feeling like it might be expensive. I just, that's just that feeling. Uh, but I'm praying that um, if it's not covered, that it will be really, really cheap. And so I'm, so I just, you know, that's my prayer request. I need the car. And so just pray that it gets fixed at a reasonable price. Amen. And one other prayer request. Jay Rose. Happy Sabbath. I just want to give that. I want to say a praise. I want to also thank the Lord for the other students who have come for college day. Amen. Amen. We are so thankful to have them here as well. And my prayer is that. Um, that the Lord will truly minister to them, even if they come or not, that the experience here will leave an impression that's not necessarily just from us. We hope that the love is very great, but we pray that, that they may be able to see the presence of God and be able to get a Amen. blessing, you know, um, even if they're here just for this time, that the Lord will minister to them for what they stand in need of. Amen. How many of you have silent requests? All right, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, our Father, we thank you for bringing us through another week. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship corporately, Father. Lord, you have heard our praises this evening. Lord, we do praise you for each and every one of these visitors, Lord, who are visiting for college days. And Father, we're just so thankful that you are leading in their lives, whether they are led here or led somewhere else. Father, I pray that they will hear the still, small voice of Jesus speaking to their hearts. Father, we praise you for just everything you do for us. Lord, there is not enough time to 
just name praises after praise after praise because, Father, you are so good to us that we don't deserve anything that you give to us. But, Father, we praise you for being a loving God, a caring God, and for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Father, this evening we want to lift up some requests, and I pray for Raul's car. Lord, I pray that whatever is wrong with it, Lord, that it would be able to be fixed at a reasonable cost. Lord, you know, most of us here, we're not rolling in money. But Father, you own the cattle on a thousand hills, and you can supply for his need. Father, we are just so thankful and, and privileged to know you and to come and worship. Father, this evening, we just want to pray for our brother Ernesto. Lord, that as he comes and preaches to us, Father, as he gives us the message that you have laid on his heart this evening, Father, we ask that you would breathe on us the Holy Spirit as Jesus did his disciples. Father, I pray that our hearts would be attentive, that every distraction, Father, would be put away, and that we could hear the voice of God speaking to our very souls this evening. So, Father, we praise you and we thank you for hearing and answering this prayer because we receive it by faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and for his sake, amen. Psalms 20, Psalms 32, or rather 34 says, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. And then in verses 4 it says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And Zephaniah, verses 3, chapter 3, Verses 14, it says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? The Lord, in verse 17, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Friends, we have many things to be thankful for. Rather, we have many things to be looking forward to. But one of the things that we can be looking forward to is hearing our Father sing. And not just hearing him sing about anything, but hearing him sing over us. And why would he sing over us? Singing over us for what he has accomplished through us. As his sons and daughters, we get to hear him sing over us. And the song we're going to sing today is called, And the Father We Sing. And so I pray that as you guys listen to the words of the song, that you will remember this hope and it will be vivid in your own minds as well.
Happy Sabbath. Feliz sábado. Shabbat Shalom. You got to learn Hebrew and Spanish if you want to make it to heaven. <laughs> Can I share something with you guys? Um, before I start, well, I haven't started yet. There's something that um, J. Rose shared with me, and I want to just extend it to you because he's Sabbath. And, you know, she, she said something that uh, really struck my mind. And she said, do you know that we are not the only ones keeping the Sabbath today? And I was thinking, you know, earthly, because, of course, we're not the only ones keeping the Sabbath today. But she said, is the, is the whole universe that is keeping the Sabbath today? In fact, Hebrews 12, 20, 22 says that when we gather together, we do not come only to Washington Hills, but we gather in Mount Zion in the presence of innumerable angels, right? So whenever you think that you are alone in this world, you know, the seven-day Adventist, this remnant, let me tell you, we are not the remnant. We are the majority, right? The whole universe is keeping the Sabbath today. So who's the remnant? The world. We are the majority. <laughs> Amen. Let me, um, let me pray just before I start, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath. Lord, this is your word. This is your message. This is your people. So I just want to ask you that according to your love and mercy, provide a blessing for each one of us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. It is connected, but I think it's not in the screen. So we, I'm pretty bad with technology, but I, I guess this is what I had to do. Yeah, amen. Okay, the title, title of my sermon is Cheap miracles cheap miracles uh you know in mexico <laughs> i'm just gonna talk about mexico <laughs> they they have a saying uh and they say that whenever you're gonna buy something you gotta look for the three b's you know what that means what that means daniel <laughs> amen <laughs> bueno bonito and barato <laughs> you know what bueno means good Amen. You know what bonito means? Pretty nice. You know what barato means? <laughs> Cheap. Man, you know Spanish. I should have preached in Spanish today. Uh, this, this phrase, what they, tr they are trying to say is that whenever you want to buy something, you got to find something that is of good quality, but also that is in a cheap price. And also it has to, it's, it has to look good. It's a, it's a hard combination, right? But what they are trying to say is actually that whenever you're going to buy something, you've got to find something that is for, uh, from real quality, from good quality, but also you've got to try to spend as little as you can. And, you know, I was thinking about this during the whole, uh, the whole week, and I said, is this something that I do sometimes in my, my spiritual life? That... I look for the blessings from God, doing as little as I can? Do I ask God to bless me just sitting right there waiting for all the blessings, paying a cheap price? You know, as a student, we understand what cheap means, right? We always have to look for something cheap. And this is going to illustrate a little bit more of what I'm talking about. You know, I know that many, many of us can relate with this picture, right? One time I was doing my driving test, and I remember I was so nervous. I was so nervous that uh, I started praying to God. But you know what is the worst thing? I didn't study for the test. So I was there. I was just so scared. But I pray, and I say, God, I need your help. I want to ask you, please bless me today. Please, God, I know I didn't study for the quiz, I for the test. <laughs> but if you help me today, 
I promise I'm going to read all that book after you help me to pass that test. <laughs> Do you think that he answered my prayers? No, no I failed that test, totally failed. And actually, I had to redo it three times. <laughs> but why is that he didn't answer my prayer? Because I was asking for a cheap miracle. I was asking for a cheap miracle. And you know, the Bible says that God hear prayer. Christ has said, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. But why he didn't do it? Because God does not perform cheap miracles. You know, the Bible says, James 4, 15, To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So whoever knows what you're supposed to do and you don't do it, the Bible says that that is imputed to you as a sin. I knew that I had to study for the test. I knew that the driving test was coming. I didn't study. And then I was asking for God for a pres in a presumptuously way. Psalm 66 says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, then the Lord will not hear me. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration. It's not an illustration. It's a story from the Bible that is going to help you understand why or how God has always required faith and works together. And I'm going to try to illustrate it in a different way. It's probably something that you haven't seen before. You know, this is Cain and Abel. Every Seventh-day Adventist knows that picture, right? It's from the Blue Bible Story Company that you might have seen in the doctor's office before. <laughs> <laughs> and... You know, but this picture might not represent the reality of what the Bible is teaching. Let me tell you what. I always thought that Cain had a blonde hair with a, like a messy blonde hair and that he was using a mini skirt, right? <laughs> but this is not something that I want to talk about today. You see, like right there, what do you see? It's the offering, right? And it's the fruits. This is what we have in mind, that whenever the Bible says that Cain brought from the fruits of the ground, he brought fruits, like a banana, mango, apple, and all that. And then we know that Abel brought a lamb. And then we say, what? Cain was rejected because he brought the wrong offering. And then Abel was accepted because he brought the right offering, right? That's, that's, that's our, our, our thinking. I want to challenge that thinking today. And just hold on to your stones before you want to, you know, want to do something. But the Bible says, I believe, and I'm going to try to prove that biblically, you know, the Bible says that everything we speak has to be according to the law and to the testimony. If we don't speak according to this, there is no light in us. Amen. I want to challenge that Cain actually brought the right offering. The second thing is that actually I do not believe that Cain brought fruits. And the third thing is that if Abel brought faith, symbolized by the lamb, then where are the fruits? Because the Bible says that faith without works is dead. So the lamb represents the faith. Now, if I ask you then, where are the works of, of, uh, of, of Abel? You're going to tell me probably, well, the fate of Abel became faith. I mean, the, the works of Abel were uh, uh, expressed when he brought the lamp. That's probably what you think. But I want to challenge that today. Okay. Exodus 34, 26 says, the first of the first, the first of the first fruits of thy land Thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. So you know, Cain knew that there was a commandment that commanded him that he should have brought the fruits of the land. So he was not all confused with what he was doing. He actually was obeying a commandment. No, what's wrong with Cain then? Why God rejected the offering? Let me tell you what, what it says on the spirit of prophecy. Cain obeyed in building an altar. Obeyed in bringing a sacrifice, but he rendered only a partial obedience. He wanted a cheap 
miracle. He was asking for the blessing of God, just bringing a partial offering. He was trying to get the benefit of a Christian life, doing as little as he could do. He was just doing a partial obedience. Now, this is what we think, right, of Cain bringing the fruit. All that beautiful fruit right there. Now, if we look carefully in that Bible text, we're going to find something different, I believe. This is, I believe, something more close to the offering of Cain. I'm going to explain that, okay? Don't worry. The offering that, the, the word offering that the Bible used for the offering of Cain is the word minha, which means appease or satisfy. Now, many scholars and many versions in the Bible have understood the context, and you're going to find this word in the Bible not, uh, not translated as offering, but as grains or cereal offering. One example, Leviticus 2.1 and Numbers 15.4. I believe because of this context of what this Bible text uh, uh, teach is that actually Cain brought something more related to this because that makes sense that he brought the offering of his hands that represent the works of his hands, right? Now, if that is true, then we have to find something also in the spirit of prophecy, right? Uh, I'll go right there. But Genesis 4, 3 and 5 says this. Just be careful, okay? Oh, no, no. And in the process, it says, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Now, it says, he brought from the fruit of the ground. It didn't say, he, he brought fruits. An offering, a minha, unto the Lord. Now, my question is, if this represent the works, then Abel was supposed to bring also works, right? And Abel also, my friends. So that means that he brought the fruits of the ground and also brought of the first links of his flock and of the fat. Why I believe that? This is going to clear all the situation. And the Lord had respected unto Abel and to his offering. The word minha, which do not relate to the burning offering, but relate to the works. So let me explain to you. Cain understood how faith and works work. He understood that God was not going to accept a partial obedience. He understood that in order to be accepted, he had to bring works and also faith. The spirit of prophecy says, let me show you real quick. They were to show their faith in the blood of Christ as the promised atonement by offering the first links of the flock in sacrifice. Besides these, the first fruits of the earth were to be presented before the Lord as a thank offering. Is that clear? Amen. This only shows that God is going to accept only a complete obedience from us. No partial obedience. Not cheap miracles. What is more important then, human effort or divine power? What is more important? Because, you know, we have the tendency to say, you know, it's, it's good that you, you know, you put all your effort, it's fine, but at the end, it's God that does everything, right? That's what we said. Human effort avails nothing without divine power, and without human endeavor, divine effort is with many of no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must act our part. His grace is given to work in us, to will and to do, but never as a substitute for our effort. You know, in our mind, we always believe that we can, we can do the 10%. God is going to take care of the rest, right? God is going to do the 99% that we cannot do. But the Bible is teaching us that actually God requires the 100% of you, and he's going to put another 100%. You know, this is Joshua. 
That's a picture, but it's, it's not. Joshua 1, 1, 5 says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over the Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that, I, that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. As I said to Moses from the wilderness, and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Ephrathes, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Now, God is telling Joshua, I will give you all the land. All this land is yours. Now, when we read the scripture, we know that, you know, Joshua, he entered in the land of Canaan. He was like, hey, guys, you know, God already told us that this is our land. So, you know, can you move? To some other place because God already said that. Is that what Joshua did? No. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I put it right here for you guys. Joshua had received the promise that God would surely overthrow these enemies of Israel. Yet he put forth as earnest effort as though success depended upon the armies of Israel alone. He did all that human energy could do, and then he cried in faith for the divine aid. You see, he knew that God had already promised that he was going to give them that, but he understood how faith and works work together. He knew that God does not perform cheap miracles, cheap miracles. So what he did is actually, he said, you know, guys, this is our land. But he gave weapons to each one of his soldiers. He made a strategy. He made a plan. He was ready. He knew. He said, you know, these people is going to fight right there. Then you are going to attack after that. And then you're going to go there and you're going to fight with all that. And he did all that knowing that God was going to perform that miracle. The secret of success is the union of divine power with human effort. Now, let me show you real quick, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 349, 351. It's a long testimony, but I'm, go I'm just going to try to summarize what it says. You know, uh, that testimony says that there was a sick man. He was, he was sick, like with tuberculosis or something like that. He was real sick. His son died. His wife was sick. And then all the church was praying for him fervently. Every day, they, they were praying for this guy because he was sick. He was part of the church. And nothing happened to him. Then the guy said, you know, I believe that if Mr. White and Sister White prays for me, I think I'm going to be healed. And it happens that Mr. White and Sister White were in a meeting one time. So the leaders of the church went to Mrs. White and told her, you know, this, this man is a good man. His son uh, had died, his wife is sick, and he's a good man. Can you pray for him? We already prayed for him, for him, but nothing has happened. We know that God is going to listen to you guys. Can you guys pray for, for him? And she said, you know, I have a commitment in my heart that I'm not going to pray for no one that I do not know. It's better that you guys pray for him because you know him better. You know his life. You know what he's been going through, so pray for him. But then the guy stepped in and he said, Mrs. White, can you pray for me, please? I know that God is going to listen to you. And she said, I cannot do that. I don't know, I, I don't know you. I don't know your life. Uh, you know that the church can pray for you. They, let him keep praying for you. And he insisted so much that she said, okay, we're going to do this. This night, I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God if I can pray for you. And whatever he reveals, then I'm going to do it. So he went back home, uh, and then they start praying. And you know what happened? In the night, God gave her a dream. And on that dream, God revealed the life of this man. And she saw that this guy was committing a sin of masturbation since his youth. And that was the reason that he was dying. Next day, 
Sister Y wakes up. She goes to the man and she said, you know, this is what God revealed to me. Is that true? He's like, yes. And I'm going to work on, a, on that. Then Sister Y says something. She said, have you tried the health reform in your family, in your life? And he said, you know, if I b- bring something to the house that is vegetarian, my wife is going to throw it by the window. You know, this testimony just show me why sometimes God cannot perform miracles in our life. You know what, God, what that guy was trying to do? He was trying to buy a cheap miracle. He was trying to obtain the blessing from God without putting the effort that he was, to put, he was supposed to do. He was trying to get the health that God could give him without doing anything. Just praying, just praying, but not doing anything. You see, this is another of my favorite quotes it's in, in the book Steps to Christ. It says, many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You decide to give yourself to Him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. You know, when I read that the first time, I was like, man, she is describing my life. This is what happens to me all the time. I'm trying to do the right thing, and I cannot do it. I'm trying to do my best effort, and I cannot do it. It seems like all that is ropes of sand. My promise is like ropes of sand. It doesn't last. And, you kn- and she says at the end, but you need not despair. What you need to understand is, and then I thought to myself, you know, she's going to say what you need to do is pray to God. Bow down. Trust in Him. Do, do, uh, just believe that God is going to bring the healing in your life. But you know what she says? What you need to do is to understand the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or, or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to man, it is there to exercise. Desire for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if you stop here, they will be of no avail. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to, point, to the point of yielding the will the will to God. They do not now choose to be Christian. What? The spirit of prophecy is saying that you can choose to be Christian. It says that desires are good. You know, and I know that each one of us, we have the desire to be like Jesus, right? Amen. But what she is saying that that desire is not enough. She is saying that many actually will be lost just with that desire in their hearts. We need to understand that we need to surrender our lives to God. You see, this is the whole matter of the Bible. The problem is not outside. The problem is not, that, is not the people. The problem is right here. And if we do not surrender our heart to God, then nothing is going to happen. And then you're going to ask, then what is surrender? Let me give you an illustration. I put just that because I need that to remember me, Coke. Uh, I remember when we were, back, we were in California, uh, a guy from the church invited us to his house. And, and then when we were there, he was so happy and he, was, he wanted to praise God because he said, you know, I gave up soda. Uh, I'm not going to drink soda no more. And God has helped me to do that. And I was like, praise God. And then while he was sharing that, I was sitting there, and I saw under his table two, two bottles like this of soda. And then I told the guy, you know, we were friends, and I said, so you said you gave up soda, right? And he's like, yes, God is helping me to do that. And I told him, then why do you keep those sodas under your table? You know what he said? 
you know, I feel sorry for them. I don't want to throw them away. <laughs> Do you think that guy was surrendering himself to God? And it is funny because I was sharing this same testimony with another member of the church. And when I told her that, she started laughing too. And she said, you know what? I gave up all rock music. I don't listen to rock music. But in my, in my room, I have a big box like this. And I kept all my favorite rock music in that box. And I was thinking, this is a cheap miracle that we're trying to buy from God. Because God can perform any miracle. But we're going to get to the point that Satan is going to tempt us. And if we have the temptation right there, guess what we're going to do? We're just going to choose to fail, right? My friend, this is something that we need to understand. We need to surrender ourselves. And if there is something, because I know they are not the only ones that are suffering from this situation, right? Probably it's not Coke, your problem, or Sprite. Probably it's not rock music. Probably it's some other things, right? But unless, unless we choose to make that decision for God, then nothing is going to happen. Our desire to be better is not going to last forever. We need to make that change. You cannot change your heart, he says. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections. But you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. If we render to him only a partial half-hearted obedience, his promises will not be fulfilled to us. Joseph, you know what the Bible says about Joseph? And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And we can think, oh man, this, you know, God really blessed this man. He, he made everything for him. He actually became the governor of, the, of one of the greatest nation, nations at that time. But you know what also the spirit of prophecy says? The marked prosperity which attended everything placed under Joseph's care was not the result of a direct miracle. But his industry, care, and energy were crowned with the divine blessing you see this is not miracles sometimes just depend on our decisions Daniel in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them he found them ten times better are you are you guys ten times better than all the world the, than the whole world that's what he's saying right here because, you know, this is not a talk, uh, talking about the Hebrew boys. This is talking about the Adventist people. And he says that those Adventist Hebrew boys were ten times better than the whole world. You know, l let, me, let me open your heart to you guys. Do you know why I think they were ten times better? Because they kept the ten commandments. That's the reason all the wisdom is encapsulated in the Ten Commandments. Since they were obedient to the Ten Commandments, they were ten times better than the whole world, of course, because the foundation of their knowledge was in the Word of God. It was not in the knowledge of the world. It was in God Himself. The Lord regarded with approval the firmness and self-denial of the Hebrew Adventist youth and their purity of motive and His blessing attended him the promise was fulfilled them that honor me i will honor at the court of babylon were gathered representatives from all the lands men of highest talent man the most richly endowed with natural gifts and possessed of the broadest culture that the world could bestow yet among them all the hebrew adventist youth were without peer this is talking about you and me brothers in physical strength and beauty, in mental vigor and literary attainment, they stood 
unravel. You see, we always thought, we always think that it's either something intelligent or either strong. You cannot, you cannot mix the whole thing, right? You cannot be a strong and at the same time intelligent. But these people, they had everything. They have physical strength, they have beauty, they have mental vigor, and they were smart. They erect form, they're firm, elastic step. That means they were exercising, right? The fair countenance, the undimmed senses, the untainted breath. All were so many certificates of, what do you think? Good habits. You see, it was not because they were, they were smart or they were favored from God. It was because they had good habits, insignia of the nobility with which nature honors those who are obedient to what? To her laws. Why they were ten times better? Because they were obedient to the law of God. They obtained their knowledge by the faithful use of their powers. Under the gui guidance of the Holy Spirit, they placed themselves in connection with the source of all wisdom, making the knowledge of God the foundation of their education. You see, they were not only reading books all day long. They were not just studying math and algebra. They studied that for sure. But he says that the foundation of their education was God. In faith, they prayed for wisdom and lived their prayer. Many are waiting for some great work to, brought to them, while daily they lose opportunities for revealing faithfulness to God. What was the purpose of the Adventist Hebrew boys then? They placed themselves where God could bless them. They avoided that which would awaken their powers and improve every opportunity to become intelligent in all lines of learning. They followed the rules of life that could not fail to give them strength of intellect. They sought to acquire knowledge for one purpose, only one purpose, that they might honor God. They did all what they did just with one purpose in their mind. What it says? To honor God. Is that the purpose that you have when you have come to Washington Hills? To honor God? Or, or it's, it's just because you want to you wanna pro a professional career? Or because you want to be a good student? Or just because you want to be a theologian that preaches good sermons? The Bible says and the spiritual prophecy says that this is the purpose of our lives. To honor God with our talents. So the conclusion, the conclusion of the whole matter. Philippians 4.13. I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the formula is really easy, my friends. This is not complicated. I plus Christ equals all things are possible. All things, nothing shall be impossible with, without, uh, with, with Jesus. My friends, <clears throat> I know the message is, I hope it was clear. And I know that <clears throat> I'm, no, <clears throat> I'm not the only one struggling in my life, right? I understand that we all need to make changes in order to follow God. When I was studying for this, for this topic, I realized that we really need to put some effort in our lives to make changes. You know, sin is not the problem. Adam and Eve were tempted even in a perfect state. They were perfect and they sin and we have seen the bible the the, uh, the the sabbath school lesson that talks about job right and the sabbath school lesson says that job was faithful and he didn't sin even even in a fallen state now this is the situation i want to bring to you guys then that means 
that our sinful actions are not consequence of our nature, but our product of our connection or disconnection with God. What we need is to be connected with the source. That's what we need. And that's why I, I would like to do something. And I, I don't know if it's, it's too much to ask. But I would like to pray for you guys. But I want you guys also to pray for me. So I would like to do this. And I don't know if Mrs. Rodriguez would approve this. I would like all the girls to be on one side. All the boys to be on another side. Because I want, I want all to pray together. You know, hugging each other as friends, as brothers that we are. And I want to ask God, or I want somebody to ask God to give us the strength to keep walking in his steps, to obey the commandments of God. And one day, my friends, I know that pretty soon, God will give us those ten times commandments, right, in our life. So what do you think, Mrs. Rodriguez? Is that okay? Okay. Can the ladies go on that side? And then the boys can come in this side. And then I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Lee if he can pray for the boys. And then Miss Sharon is here. Sharon. I mean Sherry, not Sharon. <laughs> and I don't know if we can make like a circle. And then try to hug one partner in your right arm and another one in your left arm. Okay? <coughs> ah. <coughs> yeah, yeah, come here. We can make it around the. We can make it around the tables. Right here. Hey man. Don't go too far, man. Hey man. 